Okay, let's go before the Lord again and ask for his blessing. Our Heavenly, our Heavenly Father, Lord, we bless you for this time that you've appointed for us to come and hear the matters of your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, our advocate, our high priest, the sacrifice that took away our sins and perfected us for all time. We thank you for the testimony of the Holy Spirit about him. We thank you for your grace and mercy towards us, the grace by which we stand. We thank you for all whom we have called by this gospel, praying that you grant ears of understanding and repentance unto the truth, praying that you continue to draw all your people to yourself by this same gospel and by the same Holy Spirit. I pray for strength, help my weakness, help me to speak that which is true and faithful. Lord, we honor you for this time. We pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good morning to everyone again, those who are tuned to our broadcast. Welcome to God's preaching of his gospel through a sinner. <laughs> we are a blessed people, because many do not know about the matters that God has given us to have hope in and have joy in, because this life has an end debt. It has a shelf life. It's coming to an end and not many are going to come out of this good. Not many are going to come out saved. So it is such an honor that God has bestowed upon us to call us his children and to give us the knowledge of salvation. We should not take that for granted. And this morning we are going to be back in the book of Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 verse 13 to 18, I would have preferred to do or do our teaching from the King James Version, but sometimes it's a tongue twister for me and I don't want to be dealing with that. So I default to the New King James Version and I'm aware of some of the differences that have happened because of translations and updates. And we take note of them whenever we arrive at such verses. But we're in Romans 4, 13 to 18, where Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, recorded for us and said, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith, for if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which, we, which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be, I was kind of greedy at the beginning of working on this message. I thought I would be able to go all the way to verse 17 and 18, but that's not going to happen today. That's going to have to be an installment for the next message. I wanted to say thank you to everyone who has been praying for me. The flesh had been overburdened, and the Lord is helping me to get stronger again 
nothing life threatening i just need to get some rest so thank you for your prayers and continue to pray that i have the boldness to speak the truth even if it offends people okay it's to your benefit that i continue to be bold for title a message only has one title promise according to grace promise according to grace promise according to grace and i'm going to begin this way we need to hear and pay close attention to what preachers and professing christians are saying about the gospel it is not enough for us to just quote the scriptures and even as i am discovering that it is not enough for one to say they are reformed or that they are sovereign grace it doesn't mean they've arrived at the truth the scriptures need interpretation they need understanding it is god who gives understanding and the closer a preacher is to the truth the harder it is to detect the lies it is true of any detector i'm a chemist the closer two things are in similarity the harder it is to tell them apart to separate them to resolve them so in chemistry when we have to release a product for use for human use we don't certify it using one method because one method will tell you that the product is 100% or 99.9 .9, and then another method will tell you that no it is actually 92 percent okay so you have to learn to listen carefully to what people are saying and god taught this reality the reality of this matter in the gospel context with the story of aaron's two sons in Leviticus 10, let's go to Leviticus chapter 10, the first three verses, verses 1 to 3, in the story of Aaron's two sons, Nedab and Abihu. Leviticus 10, 1 to 3, Moses recorded and said, Then Nedab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them. And they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy and before all the people I must be glorified before the people I must be regarded as holy and be glorified Nedab and Abihu were Levites sons of Aaron Aaron was a high priest and that's where involved in the tabernacle ministry as priests the sons were priests and on this fateful day they had washed themselves clean and had on priestly garments and were carrying out their ministerial duties burning incense as was commanded them by god and everyone in israel saw nothing wrong 
with what they were doing. Not a single person in Israel saw anything wrong that they were doing. It appeared like they were doing what they'd always done, burning incense to the Lord without incident. And it happens also with preachers. And many people cease listening to what preachers are saying or are proclaiming as the gospel because they give them the rite of passage just because they carry the term a sovereign grace preacher. And yet many are burning a strange fire that the Lord did not command as did the sons of Aaron. So what was wrong with what Aaron's sons were doing? They had changed the formula that God had given for salvation. God has a very specific recipe of salvation. That is Christ. Remember the whole tabernacle ministry was about the Lord Jesus Christ. The furniture, the material that was used, the altar, the sacrifice, everything, the priesthood, everything was speaking to the one person, the Lord Jesus. So the tabernacle had very specific prescriptions, instructions as to what was to be done. When and by who? A Danite, a Simeonite, could not come and offer incense to God. They could not take part in the ministry of the tabernacle. God would kill them. And Aaron's two sons had sought to improve on the recipe of Jesus. That's the issue. They sought to improve. They were adding they were subtracting from the work of the Lord by burning incense that God had not commanded them. They were tinkering with God's message. And so what was God's thinking about the matter? Did he come and say, well, you sons of Aaron, you need to be promoted to become high priest because you're just so good. You're just so inventive. I never thought that you could get such wonderful incense from Amazon. <laughs> Did he say that is fine? As long as you're genuine about it. No. He killed them on the spot. He did not cause them to be sick. He killed them dead on the spot. And Moses came and said to Aaron, his brother, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people, I must be glorified. And that is say, let us not fool ourselves. God is still serious about the matter of what his son did in the salvation of his people. He must be regarded as holy and must be glorified. In other words, let us not get too familiar with Jesus and end up messing what he did. If we are preachers and true believers of God's gospel, we cannot dilly-dally about what Christ accomplished in his earthly ministry, tinkering with the truth to suit our positions and our crowds. To preach the gospel means to preach what Christ did and what it means. So we cannot, as preachers, hide behind unexplained theological terms assumed knowledge of theological terms, 
accomplish redemption. What does that mean? Because that's how strange fires are being put in the senses of Christ. So I need you to listen carefully to what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. If I'm burning a strange fire, you should run away from me as fast as you can. Katie, leave your handbag here. <laughs> Even your shoes. Okay? But if I'm telling the truth, then God be praised for his truth. For salvation has come to us. Because the truth cannot come apart from God himself. So the matter of which God raised me to preach is his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and nothing else. God raised me to interpret the scriptures so that you'd see the son and the work of the son and what it means. Because Christ Jesus is the gospel message. Our faith in Jesus is not the good news. Christ Jesus, the revelation of God in the flesh, is the good news. And this revelation of God happened in a very particular or specific context, which God ordained from before the foundation of the world, that is, the death of the cross, the foolishness of the cross. If you go to Leviticus 23, you're going to learn about the appointed feasts. The feasts that God appointed were speaking to the coming of the Lord Jesus, that he was coming at an appointed time, in the fullness of time. That is when the real transaction of salvation was to happen. In the fullness of time. So when the Christ came and was hanging on the cross, he was just not hanging up there in limbo. He was transacting business, eternal business. He was transacting salvation. He was signing documents of salvation with his own blood. And this business is what was given the apostles, especially Apostle Paul, to expand, to help us understand the matter of the unfolding of God's sovereign will and purpose in the person of Christ, which is or was the salvation of his people to the praise and glory of God's glorious grace. So Apostle Paul has appeared after the cross, after the resurrection of Christ, and was preaching this matter to a people who among them were Jews, who had been raised under the law of Moses, the covenant of Mount Sinai, a, con a conditional covenant, the conditional covenant of the law. And they had been made to think and believe that they had title to eternal life. These words that I'm using are very, very specific and very purposeful. The Jews thought that they had title to eternal life through the righteousness that came by their own obedience to the law of Moses, to the precepts of the law. But the gospel came and said otherwise. It preached salvation through a person, salvation through the foolishness of the cross, and said it is impossible for eternal life to be acquired through the works of the law 
especially given the depraved and sinful nature of all men and women as Paul had described in Romans chapter 3 where he said there's none righteous, there's none who understands, there's none who seeks after God or have become useless. So Paul sought to teach and demonstrate and explain using the Old Testament scriptures that contrary to their thinking, their father figure Abraham as exhibit number one. Probably the most important person in their history and identity had not been made righteous and an heir of eternal life by reason of his own obedience or good works, by reason of anything found in himself. That is the beginning, the opening of Romans chapter 4. Abraham was not made righteous by any of his works. Otherwise, he would have something to bust. First and foremost, that idea of calling a sinner righteous by works flies in God's face as being boastful and God does not and will not accept it. It is contrary to the nature of God to deal with sinners, to deal with his creation on the basis of their own perceived merit because they have none. The angels that did not fall, they are called holy angels, not because of personal righteousness, but because they are separate, separate, made holy by grace. They did not earn their holiness. Okay? They are holy on account of God's own doing. So no one can merit anything from God by way of principle. So by matter of principle, God does not accept human works of any kind in exchange for righteousness, for justification, for eternal life. Because that's not the currency that he uses to make trade. Human works are illegal tender. Human works are like a fiat currency. A fiat currency is not backed up by anything valuable to it. There's no valuable commodity to it. There's no gold to back up its value. It's backed up by speculation. <laughs> Human righteousness is backed up by only speculation. There's no substance to it. So Abraham was pronounced to have title to eternal life, which is justification by faith. And we shall expound on what that means a little later. But Paul was not done yet. He said this matter was not something new. If the Jews looked at the scriptures. In fact, that is how even their own father David had been blessed of God. But David and Abraham were sinners. They were unrighteous people. But somehow they found themselves in God's blessing. How? They were beneficiaries. Or had benefited from the doctrine of imputation and non-imputation. God had not imputed the sins of David to him as to deal with him according to his sin. And it was not just the sins of David against Uriah and Bathsheba 
but all of his sins. And did you hear me clearly? When God, de- when, God, when God gave David Psalm 32 to talk about the non imputation of sin, in the context of David, it was just not the two sins that David had committed that were not imputed to him. None of his sins were imputed to him. None of them. Even the ones that were not recorded, they were not imputed to him. Because if God does not impute one sin, it follows that he does not impute any. And if God imputes one sin to you, then you are guilty of all your sins. And this in keeping with the law, that if you miss one point of the law, you are guilty of the one thing, of the whole thing. Okay? So this is necessary because of who God is. God is righteous, He is holy, He is perfect. So if He should bless you, He should only bless you on the grounds of His perfection. Okay, He will only bless you on the grounds of his perfection accomplished by the death of his son. So God did not impute some of your sins to Christ and then impute others later when you showed up in your flip-flops. Imputation of your sin to Christ did not happen when you showed up two weeks ago. It happened when the Christ showed up. That's where the transaction happened. And if Christ has been given over to death, then it means all the sins of all those that he represented were imputed to him on the cross. And the consequence of that was that the guilt of those whose sins were so imputed to him was also removed at the time of the imputation. Because satisfactory payment had been made and had been accepted. So it was clear that David was supposed to die according to the law when he met it, when he met at Uriah and took Bathsheba his wife at least for the sins that were recorded about him we know that according to the law David was supposed to die but he was forgiven he lived David lived the one who was supposed to die Even just for the two sins, he lived. He lived because God did not desire to kill him. Therefore, God did not account his sins to him. But the life of David that was preserved was not his physical life. It was David not being condemned to hell. It was not the physical life of David. So there was more to what was happening in this story and in this conversation. Nathan the prophet said this to the king in 2 Samuel 12. Nathan the prophet was despised by God to go speak to King David on account of his sin. This is what Nathan said in 2 Samuel 12 verse 14. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion 
to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Nathan said, the son of David born to him would surely die. Pay attention to the seriousness of that declaration. This is not coming from Nathan. It's coming from God. And God is saying to David, your son David shall surely die. And had to die. And that son of David with Bathsheba was afflicted by God. It is God who killed that son of Bathsheba and David, and he died, I think, on the eighth day or so. But that's not what God was talking about. The son of David was prophetic of the greater son of David and Bathsheba, the Lord Jesus Christ. So what happened? David did not die because God intended to do something with his sin. He intended to forbear the trespasses of David until the arrival of his greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was able to deal with the sin of David, to whom those sins would be imputed. Romans 3, 24 and 25. Paul says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Pay attention to verse 25. God had passed over the sins of the saints of the Old Testament, waiting for their remission, waiting for their cancellation, in the appearance of the greater son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. He alone could cancel sin. And sin cannot be canceled apart from the shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So in between time, God was forbearing with them. He was not imputing their sins to them as to condemn them. That is all he could do until the redemption price had been given by way of the death of the Lord Jesus. The redemption price had to be paid. So the Lord Jesus appeared later in the flesh. And when the sins of David were imputed, imputed to the Lord Jesus, as were all the sins of all the elect of all time, they were elected, they were imputed to him at the same time. He was found guilty. And when he was found guilty, he was crucified. And when he was crucified, his people were justified freely as was captured in the testimony of Barabbas. When the Lord Christ was crucified, made the payment, his people were justified from all their sins because the payment had been deposited in God's treasury box.
So the Lord died. Exactly as Nathan the prophet had prophesied. And when the son of David died, what did he do for David? He paid for all the sins of David and Bathsheba too. He propitiated for their sins, which means he satisfied the sin debt. He made it good. He cleared whatever David owed and left no charge in his account. He satisfied. So satisfaction and propitiation mean the same thing. But the bigger term, the bigger word is propitiation. Propitiation means the removal of wrath by way of payment. The removal of wrath. So Christ did not just make a payment. He removed the wrath. And that means he justified his people. When that payment was made, they come together as a belt comes with the pants. Okay? The belt and the pants go together. But when Jesus came and died, he justified David right there on Mount Calvary, just as he justified all of God's people. That was God's appointed place of removing sin. That's why you have a dishwasher or a washing machine. What happens when you put your clothes in the washing machine? What's the intention? The intention is to make them clean. It is to wash them. That's where you wash clothes. So the cross is God's washing machine to remove all sin. That's where the washing happened. So the altar was the place of death. It was the place of removal of sin, of cleansing, of purification. That is where the fire of God's judgment happened and the ashes were formed. These all happened in the altar. And the cross was the altar. And the sacrifice that was on the altar was the Lord Christ himself, who was offering himself as a sacrifice and also as a high priest. So the Lord Jesus made the payment and God accepted it on behalf of David. And this was the only basis of David's claim to eternal life and righteousness. God imputed the righteousness that came by way of Christ's blood to David's account. So what happens when the high priest dies? What happens when the high priest dies? All those that were waiting for his death are justified from all their sins. That is Numbers 35 teaching. And we're going to have a message next week from Numbers 35. Titled, The Death of the High Priest. That is the gospel declaration, justification of all of God's people of all time. From all their sins of all time. By the offering of of the perfect high priest and sacrifice called Jesus on Mount Calvary. Follow the arguments, follow the arguments, the person of Christ, the place of atonement. It's Mount Calvary because that's the altar. Okay? And this truth was also anticipated with the teaching of the day of atonement. Yam Kapu in Leviticus 16. 
that once the victim had stood, the victim that was the sacrifice, had stood on behalf of the people and had shed his blood, then Israel was good for a year, but in a temporary way. But with the Lord Jesus, as the book of Hebrews teaches us, he perfected for all time the removal of sins. He perfected it for all time. On the sanctified ones, the elect ones, the chosen ones. And that is why as the high priest, he is seated. He is seated. Because he already justified his people before God. So we have lazy boy gospel. <laughs> because the Lord is also seated. If the Christ is not seated, we do not have lazy boy theology. He is rested from his works. He made an end to the purification of sin. And on account of that, he is also exalted. Christ cannot be exalted if he did not justify his people when he died. He could not be. Because part of his exaltation was connected to his justification of his people. Justification is the removal of condemnation. It is God who justifies. It is his pronouncement. It is his declaration on all whom Christ redeemed. God is not sitting a court session every time someone hears the gospel. God is not. To say that is to show that we don't understand the matter. God's courtroom was actually in session when the Lord was being charged by Pilate, by the Jews, the chief priests, Herod, being crucified. The whole tabernacle system was on display and in operation right there on Mount Calvary. The Lord Jesus was not just a sacrifice and a high priest when he was on the cross. He was also a mediator. That's why he was in between the two thieves telling us who he is, he is the mediator between God and man, mediator between life and death, the mediator, the person who separates condemnation from justification. He was an intercessor. He was an advocate. The Lord was making closing arguments for the case of his people saying, my people, set my people free. Let these go away, as he said to the soldiers when they tried to apprehend Peter and company. Set this go. If you're looking for me, let this go away. He was interceding for his people before God. Why? Because now, I have made payment for them. I have come to make it good for them and I'm going to clothe them with my own righteousness. The garments of vindication. Righteousness also means garments of vindication. You are being vindicated from being a sinner. That's what the righteousness of Christ means. It vindicates you before God as a righteous person. So, that to say, the cross of Christ was the intercession of Christ. Christ was interceding by the cross. And there were a lot of things that Jesus said on the cross that we 
find in the Psalms. Don't think they're just 10, 15 sayings of Jesus on the cross. Those are the recorded ones in the New Testament. If you read the Psalms, most of them, they are Jesus talking on the cross. Okay, go read Psalm 55. If a payment has been made, then there has to be an immediate exchange of ownership. That is why you get a receipt whenever you make a purchase. The receipt is proof of purchase and ownership. And there's no person who goes to the shop to buy groceries and pays for them. But then the store refuses them to carry home the items that they purchased with their own money. If you buy things online, by law, the merchant, whoever person, is supposed to give you a receipt. They will send it to you by email. They will send another receipt with a package to prove purchase and ownership. If that happens here with us, if we go and buy stuff and we do not get receipt, and then we are not allowed to carry the goods that we purchased. You're going to raise hell. I guarantee you that. You're going to raise hell. You're going to go crazy. And yet, that's exactly what some people are saying. That Jesus just paid for the sins of his people. But the same people are still not saved. They're still under condemnation until they believe. To remain under condemnation means the payment was not made. It's that simple. To remain in debt, it means the payment was not made. That's the only way you remain in debt. If the payment has been made, then you don't owe anything. So if we say that Jesus died, but the very same people that he died for are still under condemnation until a future date, is to say what? That when Christ died and went back to the Father, he did not present anybody that he served to him. He came back empty-handed. Well, that is only true if faith is a condition that causes justification. And if faith is what causes justification, then it is not the blood of Christ that justifies. But what God works in a person. And if that is the case, then we have works gospel. We don't have salvation by grace alone. So in the matter of Abraham, what was Paul arguing? Was Paul also arguing the timing of when Abraham was made righteous? Because someone will come and say, see, Abraham was declared righteous by faith. Or declared righteous only at faith. Abraham was declared righteous only at faith. Is that what Paul is arguing? I need people to pay attention to what I'm saying. We're not making this message just to have something to listen to on Sunday. This is very important argument. Paul was not arguing for the timing of justification. He was arguing the how. What causes justification? The means by which Abraham was declared as righteous. We have to work the context. 
Again, the Jews were thinking that Abraham is their first father of circumcision. Would have been declared righteous because he had been circumcised. And they're putting a lot of weight to that. And if that were true, they too would be righteous by reason of having the same physical circumcision of Abraham, which was also found in the law. But Paul says no. God pronounced Abraham as righteous before the physical circumcision. So that undoes the Jewish argument. His circumcision was only testimony of the righteousness that he already possessed. The righteousness that is apart from law keeping. So the timing argument here by Paul was not at all saying Abraham was made righteous at faith. And then those who argue as such will say Abraham was made righteous at faith and then only did God impute Christ's righteousness to him. And it doesn't matter, even in our particular context, if Sean came to faith last week on Thursday at nine in the morning, then God imputed righteousness some seconds before then. That's the argument. But that's not the gospel. <laughs> not at all. The timing argument was between Circumcision and uncircumcision with the express purpose of destroying the Jewish argument that Abraham standing before God had something to do with his obedience to law keeping or any precepts of the law and in this context, physical circumcision. And God says, Abraham was called righteous before circumcision for a particular reason. Because God was anticipating calling the elect from the uncircumcised people of the Gentiles also as righteous. So if God was going to pronounce Abraham as righteous, on account of his physical circumcision, then by matter of principle, everybody else who comes after Abraham could not partake in the promise of God unless they also were physically circumcised as Abraham. Understand me? And also, that would exclude women who cannot be physically circumcised, like for real. Because Paul says, God did it this way so that the promise of salvation would be sure to all the seed, to all the elect. So if you put conditions to it, you exclude a lot of people that God deemed to save. You understand what I'm saying? So Abraham became a representative person for both Jew and Gentile in the matter of salvation, in the matter that God communicated, the matter of promise of salvation according to grace alone. Let's keep working the arguments. Verse 13 of Romans 4. Paul says, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham, or to, his, or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Paul says here is the evidence that Abraham was not saved on account of works. In fact, the promise, that is, 
God's promise of an heir of Christ, because Christ is the one in view. Though initially that promise came in the shadow and type of Isaac, the promise of an inheritance did not come to Abraham through the law. It did not. In other words, there's no aspect of salvation that comes to you by way of the law. And that implies that one cannot be sanctified by the law. You cannot use the law for your sanctification. It's popular reformed teaching. It's false teaching. Why? Because sanctification, just as righteousness, just as the Holy Spirit, comes in the package of the promise that is apart from the law. Salvation is a fruit basket. When you go to the store and buy a fruit basket, you're going to buy pears, bananas, oranges, whatever else is in that basket. It's one basket. The whole of salvation comes as a fruit basket and it comes as a promise, which means it comes by grace. So those who say, oh, there's a third use of the law to help in the sanctification of God's people, they're not telling the truth. Okay? Abraham became an heir of the world through Christ and that means by grace alone. So the promise that came to Abraham was through the righteousness of faith. Now to the question, what does that mean? What does that mean? The righteousness of faith. The righteousness of faith is God's righteousness. But that's what Paul has labored in Romans chapter 3. The righteousness of God apart from the works of the law has been revealed. The righteousness of faith is the saying the faith of Abraham is what caused or activated the promise to Abraham. Was God saying faith in and of itself is what justifies a sinner before him? No. No, that's not what God was saying. What is faith? Hebrews 11, 1 and 2. Hebrews 11, 1 and 2. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. The elders obtained a good report. What did Abraham not sin? Because he's part of the elders. He had not seen the promise. He had not seen Christ in his flesh. But he saw the day of Christ from afar. And he was glad. He saw the day of Christ from afar. Yeah? From afar. Christ is the substance of faith. He is the substance of things hoped for. 
Why? Because all of God's promises are yes and amen in him. Faith is the evidence of things, not sin. Faith is evidence. It is not cause. See the distinction. It is the evidence of things. The evidence of your justification because you do not see your justification. But the fact that you have faith in the substance that is Christ. Because all things consist in Christ. So Christ is the substance. So faith evidences possession of the substance. It does not cause the substance. Okay? Let me repeat. <laughs> faith evidences possession of the promise but in the context of Abraham where Abraham was on the timeline of salvation history Christ had not yet come in the flesh yes he appeared as a Christophany in the Old Testament but he had not yet entered human flesh and because of that, Hebrews 11.13 says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises. Yeah? Having seen them, but having seen them afar off, we are assured of them. They were assured of them. Faith gives us assurance of the promises. Our possession of the promise. They embraced them. And confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. On account of that. And this is how Abraham obtained a good report. A good testimony. But let's keep working this. So the promise was Christ Jesus. Christ was a promise. Christ was the inheritance. And God caused Abraham to apprehend that this promise was not conditioned on his own obedience to God. Because Abraham had even tried to make this promise contingent on his own doing by taking Hagar, the maid servant, and trying to work those promises in his own flesh. And he ended up with, I, with Ishmael. Okay? So Abraham could not cause it. He could not expedite the promise. It had to come in the appointed time. I used to do McDonald drive through I used to expedite orders. <laughs> get things moving fast so that Sean does not get hungry. Abraham could not maintain the promise. But was wholly dependent. The promise was wholly dependent and conditioned on God alone. And that is why in Genesis 15, as we have noted, when it came time to God giving this promise to Abraham, God put Abraham to sleep at the cutting of that Abrahamic covenant. Abraham did not participate because God caused a deep sleep. He put him to a nap. Yeah? And Genesis 15 was testimony that Abraham was not a participant who was bound to perform any terms of bringing the promise of salvation to himself 
or to anybody else. He only stood as a beneficiary. He only stood as a recipient of God's grace. So in that context, you have to see yourself also that you took a nap with Abraham. <laughs> because that covenant was an unconditional covenant. Abraham had no terms to perform for the promise to come to him. So when God causes a sinner to see, to understand, to receive the truth, that the promise of your salvation is apart from your own works, that is called faith. Faith is saying, God alone is the cause and he is the bringer of the promise. He is the one who brings the promise in his bag. When Jesus came from heaven, he had a bag that carried things. He did not bring an empty bag. He had things that he had brought to his children. Like any caring brother or father would do. So faith is saying, I bring nothing to the table of salvation. I have zero contribution to the matter. Because if the sinner had any contribution to the matter of salvation whatsoever, to whatever degree, then the promise would not be of grace, but of works. It would be of law. But Paul says, verse 14 of Romans 4, For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. If those who are of law keeping, that is those who want to enter into this promise and partake of its blessings, of its benefits, by reason of their own works, by reason of their own obedience, and become heirs by that. Faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. In other words, Paul is saying, there's no child who works to cause their own inheritance. Because by nature, an inheritance is what is given from the labor and enterprise of another. In the context of the children, the labor and enterprise of the parents, of the grandparents, of the aunts, the uncles, or whoever person has undertaken to give the inheritance. But the beneficiary makes zero contribution to that inheritance. So if you work for your inheritance, then it is not an inheritance <laughs> that becomes a paycheck, which is what Paul has argued at the beginning of Romans 4. It is a paycheck that you owe yourself. But there's no language of owing in the matter of the promise. The heirs do not owe God for the inheritance because it was given unconditionally. And Christ. 100% funded this inheritance. He funded the retirement package all by himself. Because to say you owe God means this promise was conditional on Paul doing something. Also, God does not owe the heirs and inheritance. God owes no one nothing. 
Because the heirs were made so by grace alone. And the inheritance is by grace alone to the praise of his glory. Everything that you possess in Christ was freely given. It was given unconditionally. So the transaction of the giving of it is not dependent on Sean activating some level of faith. Faith cannot cause it. Not in the manner that you and I would exercise it. It cannot cause a blessing of such magnitude and significance. Because these are eternal blessings. They are irrevocable blessings. Because the gifts and calling of God are irrevo irrevocable. They are without repentance. Okay? So if those of the law are made heirs, listen to me, someone. If those of the law are made heirs, are made righteous, are entitled to justification by anything in them or done to them, even by God himself, then the whole matter of the promise is made of no effect. It is void. It is void. The promise is invalidated. It is no longer binding. Faith is made void. Not because it was causing anything in the first place. But because that faith now believes in nothing. It is believing in a relationship that does not exist anymore. That's why it's made void. If you condition any aspect of salvation, of the promise on anything that you do, then your faith is made void because there's nothing to believe in anymore. Faith is empty if any matters of salvation are conditioned on the doing of the sinner, the response of the sinner, the running of the sinner. Remember again, the promise is an unconditional promise. You have to work this vocabulary into your theological thinking. Tell people that the promise of salvation is unconditional. It is of grace alone. Repeat it even from the housetop. If you can put a ladder up on top of the house, get it up there and proclaim it on top of the ladder. <laughs> Let's keep going on this. I'm going to beat it to death. Okay, it's necessary. <laughs> the recipients of this promise get it without cause found in them. That is why Jesus can tell a man like the thief on the cross who has spent 100% of his life stealing from people that this day you have entered into God's promises. <laughs> I'm like, ah, how do you do that? Jesus does not condemn the man for any of the thieving that he did. Jesus says absolutely nothing about the stealing of the man. And I'll tell you the honest truth. The man stole so much stuff from people that he didn't even remember some of the victims. But Jesus did. Jesus knew all the victims, and yet that man was still possessing the promise of salvation. That's scandalous. That's offensive. That's the gospel that we are declaring. That is true, free, and sovereign grace gospel. Okay? That is why we cannot say Jesus died, but did not justify his people. 
What is he waiting for? Because if you say that you are attaching some other future condition to be fulfilled in the sinner, and the conditions now vary from church to church. Yeah? So what did he come to do then? Did Jesus come on vacation in Palestine to deal with all those sand storms and the heat in the Middle East and that's vacation? No. Justification of all the elect of all time was by the blood of Christ and was accomplished when he came. He brought the inheritance. He gave the inheritance. Was when Jesus came in the flesh. He came to unveil the last will and testament. As the testator of the covenant that he established with his father on behalf of the people. So the whole matter of salvation was contained in a will and last testament. This is Hebrews teaching. The book of Hebrews teaches that. That's what he came to do. So knowing that, it is impossible to say that Jesus came and activated the will and last testament. And yet the children who are supposed to benefit from it were left with an empty bag. We're left with no salvation just because they're ignorant. If I were to die today, my daughter has something that I've written down for her. If I tell her 10 bucks or 20 billion, she doesn't even know the difference but it doesn't change the reality of what she will possess. She will grow in understanding of what it is that I would have left her, but it's not conditioned on her understanding what it is at the time when it happened. Okay? So I will not accept this politics around Jesus. There's now more politics around Jesus. There should not be politics about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. So we need to understand the relationship between faith and promise. The promise, again, means Christ. It means all of salvation. It means justification in and by Christ. And faith is saying the sinner does not help in the matter of it. And faith is important, not as cause, but as in acknowledgement that I had nothing to do with my salvation. Christ is he who did it all for me, but many in the professing church world want to elevate faith as if faith is what causes the promise to come to a sinner. And that is not true, unless if one is talking about the faithfulness of Christ as his obedience. Faith as found and exercised by the sinner is evidence of possession of the promise, evidence of possession of the righteousness that God freely gave in the will and last testament of Christ Jesus. And faith is a gift that God gives only to all whom he put in the will and testament of Christ to tell them, to inform them that they have been made rich They've been made co-heirs with Christ. That they were justified in the death of Christ Jesus. And have been blessed with him. 
with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. That's what faith does. It does not cause, it reveals that which was hidden to you but was already true in Christ. So what about the law? Verse 15. Do you see why I said at the beginning, I wasn't going to go to verse 17 and 18? <laughs> verse 15. What about the law? Because the law brings about wrath. For where there's no law, there's no transgression. In contrast, this is what the law was given to do. To bring about wrath. To bring about condemnation. To bring about that side of God that you don't want to hear about. That's what the law was given to do. And the literal rendering of verse 15 is, like that first part of verse 15 of Romans 4, where it says, because the law brings about wrath. The literal rendering is, the law keeps on producing wrath. Present continuous. And that means, as long as one continues to bring themselves under the law, the law continues to do what it was given to do, which is to continuously condemn the sinner because of their disobedience. That is why you talk to these people, we have had these reformed preachers, then they started doing the law, then they feel condemned, and then they are looking for assurance. They're like, oh, I don't have any assurance. I'm like, who have you been listening to? <laughs> Why don't you have assurance? It's because you've been listening to people who are not preaching the gospel. If you go back to the law, the law will do what the law was given to do, to keep on producing condemnation. So you will never have a clear conscience as long as you put yourself back to Mount Sinai. Yeah? We sin continuously, so the law would continuously condemn us if we keep going back to it. And that is not an anti law idea, as some will say, that is actually gospel. But where there's law, Paul says, there's no transgression. And that is a matter of principle. And this is saying, A person may still be sinning in his or her actions, but if there's no command prohibiting what they're doing, prohibiting their activity, then whatever they're doing is not considered a transgression. It is not considered as overstepping of a prohibition that does not exist. You cannot break a law that does not exist. That's what Paul is saying. It's a matter of principle. Okay? As he already stated in Romans, so as he would state in Romans 5.13, for some reason I thought it was Romans 3.13, it's Romans 5.13. Romans 5.13, Paul says, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there's no law. That's the same principle. You can't make someone guilty of something that is not written not to be done. And that is a very remarkable statement that Paul had just made. And I believe what Paul is saying is that the promise... <laughs> you never heard anything from anybody about this, what, about, what I'm about to say. It's remarkable. What I believe Paul is actually saying by that statement. That the grace of God has put you into this state of grace. And in this state of grace, there are no laws, commandments that you have to perform to keep it or to break it 
so as to get out of the promise. There's no law for you to enter, to maintain, to break, to get out. Hear this. Because of Christ alone and what he did, all the elect have been put in a state in which there's no commandment to obey, to make you partakers of it. And since there's no law for them to do, as to enter or as to receive the inheritance, there's no law for them to break to enter or to come out of it. That's the nature of their inheritance. Because the inheritance is given without any conditions, at least once it has been written that Sean is going to get 25,000, that's what he's going to get. If the 25,000 is there, then that's what he's going to get. It doesn't matter if he decides to drink it all one night, <laughs> he's going to get it. So there's no law for you to break to come out of the promise of God. Because God did not put a condition to be fulfilled by you or to be broken by you to maintain the promise, to maintain the blessing. Okay? It's wonderful. <laughs> There's no law to be broken under grace so as to get one out of grace. There's no condition to be fulfilled by you so as to enter into the promise is freely given by Christ. So, to the exhortations, the commands of the New Testament, those are not conditions that we meet to enter or remain in that promise. So, Sean can mess up things today. Paul can mess up things next week. Some things will be more painful than others. But I cannot come and say, oh, I think Sean has gotten out of the promise. That would be false teaching. Okay? And that's what Paul is arguing. Verse 16, that would be our last verse, I believe, from Romans 4, for today, therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace. Therefore, the promise Salvation, eternal life, justification, righteousness, sanctification, which is holiness, adoption, redemption, are of faith. And that means of doing nothing. Ultimately, that's what faith means for you and I. It means they are of doing nothing as to cause them. That they may be of God's doing alone. That's the contrast. That they may be of God's grace alone. That is the proper understanding of the context. Faith is not causative. It is only looking out to the one who is all those things for you. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.30, but of him you are in Christ Jesus. Of him, the contrast is you doing stuff and him doing things. And Paul says, but of him, you are in Christ. So, what has, be what has Christ become for us? Who became for us wisdom? From God. And righteousness. And sanctification. And redemption. So Christ is your righteousness. He is your justification. When he shows up, when he makes payment, that's your righteousness. That's your justification. That, as it is written, he who glories, 
Let him glory in the Lord. So the redeemed are not justified at faith. They are justified in their substitute, in their representative, in their surety. Okay? And the giving and coming of the promise. Because the will and last testament cannot be opened for distribution until the death of the testator who gave it has been proven, which means it is the death clause that kicks in the distribution of whatever was in the will. So what was in the will? Justification. So when Christ died, the death clause kicked in the distribution of that righteousness, of that eternal life, that now you possess it. It's no longer future anymore. You possess it here and now. It is unlike in the time of Abraham when they were looking to Jesus coming. We are not looking to Jesus coming. We are coming at a time when the will and testament, the last testament, is already active. It's already working. So the promise of salvation, the promise of salvation, of doing nothing in and by the sinner, of meeting no condition in the sinner, was this way. So that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I've made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. The promise is doing nothing by doing nothing, not by the Jews keeping the law, not by Abraham being circumcised, or by Gentiles doing anything for that matter, so that it will be sure to all. Salvation is 100% unconditional to all the elect, no matter their ethnic extraction, because putting conditions, as I said earlier, would exclude some of the heirs who would not have been able to meet those conditions. Yeah? Also, that means faith itself is not a condition that we meet, but is a gift through which God communicates to us the matter of our inheritance, and through it we acknowledge that we had no cause in the matter, and that is why this promise can also be given to those who are infants, who are children, those who have mental challenges, special needs people, as long as they are elect. The condition for them is the same for everyone. The promise is of grace, not of works, not of our knowledge of the promise. I need to repeat this. You do not possess the promise because of your knowledge of the promise. You have knowledge of the promise because you possess it. Okay? What if you get involved in an accident and you lose your ability to think or hear, read, see anything? Do you then lose the promise? Do you lose your justification? Does God say, oh, she doesn't understand the things that she used to understand. I think I'm going to revoke what I had given her. No, it doesn't work like that. That is why. Free and sovereign grace, if we understand it this way, is very easy to talk about all these other seemingly difficult things that people want to raise for God. God has zero problems when it comes to salvation. All the issues that people come up with is just their own theological systems. 
There are theological systems that are based on unbelief of who God is. God is not going to fail to save any of his elect. Never. Because all of salvation is 100% outside of the person. Him coming and teaching us the gospel is not that he really, really needs for us to know this. <laughs> to be honest, we don't need this. This does not cause our salvation. He is only communicating to us what his sovereign will and purpose from eternity has always been. He always determined to save a people to himself. And in time, by his spirit, he comes and he tells us, gives us kind of a down payment. Would you think that the God of eternity, all there is to know about him, can be contained in some Bible? The stuff that he has done, the thing that he knows, that we are ignorant of, they are not dependent. He's just communicating some knowledge to us that he exists and that is this is his predisposition towards all his people that is given faith but for us to turn around and condition eternal matters on our imperfect knowledge is not accurate okay it's not accurate hear this I'm almost done this gospel is good news for such as cannot speak for themselves. Yeah? Because Christ is the advocate for such who cannot speak for themselves. Both you and I cannot speak for ourselves before God. And that's why he gave the testimony of the mute. This gospel is for those who cannot hear. Because you and I cannot hear. That's why he gave the testimony of the dumb. Christ hears and he knows everything. This gospel is for those who cannot read or see the blind. Romans 9 theology. Christ is our light. Christ is the author and finisher of faith, of knowledge. And many people say grace who do not mean it, who do not understand it, because they still want to exclude based on things that God did not use as basis of exclusion. Okay? <laughs> There's no better person, beloved who understand that they have no merit, like infants, like the special needs people, you see them on their wheelchairs, and you see how dependent they are on the help of another person. And they exist for a reason, by God's decree. God has given them to teach us the truth of the matter of our salvation. And God is saying, we are all special needs children. Spiritually, we are all special needs children. And this is just a reminder so that we do not think highly of ourselves, but only as recipients of his grace and mercy. And as Paul said, and our sufficiency is from God. What do you have that you did not receive? All our sufficiency is from God. That is God's gospel of free and sovereign grace. It is all in Christ. It is all about Christ. And this Christ signed by his own blood, all the papers of the promise, the papers of the inheritance, 
the purpose of the will and last testament. And when he came, he activated the clause of that will and last testament at his death because his death had been proven. Okay? Amen. We're done. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we bless you for these many words that have been given from the text of Scripture. Words about the matter of the inheritance and why it is of grace. The understanding of faith and grace. That faith is faith only as evidence of possession, not as causing the promise itself. Because Abraham did not activate the promise by his faith. The promise was going to come only by God's grace and in the appointed time who was Christ Jesus himself. He was the promise. He was the heir who was pictured in the testimony of Isaac. We thank you, Lord, for those who have listened. I pray that you spoke to them in the way that you alone are able to speak. And I pray for their continued learning of this wonderful gospel. Because it did, it is a wonderful gospel because it is a declaration of something that already happened, of a last will and testament that was already given to all its beneficiaries. And we are not causing anything. We are only coming to the realization that we are made heirs and co-heirs with Christ. We thank you, Lord. Be with us, you know, going in and out. May you grant comfort to your people. Many who are battling all kinds of things, spiritual things, physical uh, issues. Uh, some assurance, help them, Lord Jesus. Some just battling uh, all kinds of arguments about these matters. May you grant peace. Be still and know that you are the Lord, you rule and reign of all your creation. We thank you for this day. Be with us always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, good people.